Hey everyone, I've got Scott back with me today. Uh, my name's Andy, the Finding Value Finance channel. Uh, we're gonna tackle shipping because I know Scott was a big uranium bull and I, I used the word was, the operative word, and he still is. But uh, I, I flashed a chart in front of him because I know that he's a technical analysis guy just like me. And what I tend to do is I tease people with what I think are really good looking charts to see how they react and, and to see what they do. So Scott, welcome, you know, welcome back. Appreciate you having on, you know, on the, on the channel. Thanks for having me back, Andy. Yep. So I'm going to flash everyone the chart that I flashed Scott. Uh, this is like, <laughs> uh, I've got it pulled up. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. And this is what I did to him. I flashed him this chart and I didn't have, some of this stuff on here, perhaps. Uh, I, I drew a couple of lines on there and he started looking at it like I kicked him, you know, I kicked his dog or something with his mouth open. I was like, what the heck is this? And obviously I I know what I'm looking at. I'm sure he knows what he's looking at, but this is this is a double bottom pattern. Uh, the thing that I think really got both of us interested in the stock, and he can, you know, obviously comment on this as well is the genetics of the stock. That's what I call uh, the genetics. So when you, when you look at this and you, I'm just gonna show you a trend-based FIB extension. Uh, it's this move here. That's what got us really um, interested in the stock. Or one of the things that got us very interested in the stock was this, was this move from $1.15 all the way to almost $20. So if you do a, a trend-based FIB extension and anyone who looks at charts, they'll, they'll kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, what this means is the, this could be the first kind of move that precipitates larger moves behind it. And if we were to do what I consider to be kind of a normal type move, a 1.618 Fibonacci move, um, a Fib extension move, you're at $30 and we're sitting here at like a dollar, when we were looking at it, a $1.58, $1.60. Uh, if it goes and, and goes into beast mode, I call it beast mode, where you get up into these other ranges, uh, it's possible to go to 47 or even $65 uh, plus. That is kind of matching where we were uh, the previous bull market uh, in history. Here. I think it goes up to 180. It, does. it was it, at it, 180, it, something like that. <laughs> Obviously, like this is pre, <laughs> pre consolidation. Yes, it goes to share. 180 to be exact. And but Andy, show them. So, so this is on log chart, right? So, show Andy, show the viewers what it okay. looks like on just normal chart. <laughs> so this, this is, is, what, what this really is unlogged because and then we can scroll in it's just absolutely uh ridiculous yeah. looking at this downward move and there is some dilution in this stock uh obviously it's scared a lot of people because uh they look at it and they say i got diluted i'm never buying this again but uh yeah. we have found out that there's reasons for the dilution uh, and that's what you need to do so and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it, you know, uh, the first thing that gets me interested is the chart. It has mm -hmm. to have a good looking chart. It's, it's like looking at a girl and being physically attracted to the girl or guy, whatever your thing is. But when I look at this chart, it's like, wow, this draws me in. And what about yeah. you, Scott? What did you see when you saw the chart that I flashed in front of you? Yeah, so... Um... Andy and I were just spending like hours just going through charts, right? And then I didn't really, I, I, every single chart you showed me, I was like, oh, you're only going to outperform this. You're only going to outperform this. You're only going to outperform this. And then you showed me this. I was like, whoa, hold on. What's the ticker? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, I noted down the ticker. And what really amazed me was the fundamentals. Um, yeah, so like immediately I'm drawn to this chart because I'm looking at this. And, and if you look at um, Ethereum chart, I don't know if you can pull up a Ethereum chart very quickly. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you can pull it up if you want to real quick. Okay, sure. I'll stop sharing. Um, <clears throat> okay, so if you look at Ethereum chart, oops. like, <laughs> So if you look at the Ethereum chart, the, the, two things, right? Two things really get me. So Ethereum chart, this is a weekly chart on, the, on Ethereum. So basically you see a double bottom, very similar pattern to CTRM. Um, and you see like it run really, really hard, right? 
And, and the length of this is quite long. So you're talking about a long, long base here, which is from 2018 to 2021 or 2020, end of 2020. But if you look at CTRM, this is what really got me, right, Andy? So it, and, and hold on, let me just go back to Ethereum. Another thing that I wanted to point out was this double bottom here is only like 4x. So I say only <laughs> because I'm comparing to CTRM, which is ridiculous. And, and that's the fractal that um, Andy's talking about, basically. But you go from $100 to, to the top of this double bottom pattern here, which is 362. So it's you know less than 4x. But if you go to CTRM, and this is why I was so drawn to this, because this is a weekly chart, but now look at this. Like this is even shorter in terms of the timeline. So this is the genetics of the chart. I love that. I love that term that Andy, uh, Andy kind of instilled in me. But um, yeah, this is such a short time frame. So you're talking about from 2020. So Ethereum lasted like two years, but this double bottom here, it's less. It's it's less than that, and the fractal that Andy's talking about from the bottom to to the top here, it's like 20x rather than Forex that's shown in the Ethereum chart. So I'm like, okay, this chart has the genetics, um, the, the right genetics going for it. I was like, okay, let me look at the fundamentals. And this is what really blew my mind. So I wasn't really interested in shipping at all. Like all the credit is due to Andy because like I wasn't looking at it at all. And then Andy introduced me to this. And when you look at the fundamentals, this is what's crazy about this thing because when I look at any company, I just open this up, all the fundamentals, you can get the indicators here, just punching in whatever you want to punch in. So you can put in like net income or uh, revenue or whatever it might be. Um, but this is what really attracted me to, uh, to this because you're talking about a market cap. So this is market cap here. You're talking about a market cap of $173 million for this company. So that's the, the value of the company if you add up all the shares and, and, and multiply by uh, the share price, the current share price. But if you look at the price to book value, which is how much does the company have relative to, uh, how much is the company priced at relative to its book value of the assets that it has? It's trading at 0 0.5. Like that basically means that if you're buying a cafe and the cafe, the building and the equipment and everything is valued at say $20 or $200,000, you're buying the cafe for $100,000. You're, you're paying half for the book price of what the company actually owns. But then another thing that's really interesting here is you've got total revenue. This is quarterly revenue. Last quarter, like you can see a clear uptrend in, in the revenue, like huge growth in revenue. So you start from nothing, 2.8 million in revenue. And then you go up to seven, you go up to 22, and then it just blows out like 43 million and then 60 million. <laughs> you see a huge growth. And for the, oh, not for the first time, but... Um, they haven't been making profit for a long while, but then now, like, it's just, it's just skyrocketing. So you see 6 million um, first quarter, I think, or six, no, June 2021, 6.5 million profit. Um, September 2021, you see 15 million profit. And then last quarter, they reported close to 30 million in profit. And if you annualize that, 30 million, so 30 million times four is 120 million. It's, pretty much trading close to its market mm -hmm. cap. <laughs> which, means, which means if you buy a cafe, like if you're, if you're, let's just go back to the cafe example, but if you're buying a cafe, like your investment will be paid off, uh, will be paid off within about a year or just over a year. So mm -hmm. for me, the fundamentals really attracted this, uh, attracted me to this stock. But we can maybe talk about, and, and the next step that we basically went into was, okay, well, Andy, Andy knew. Sorry, did you want to say something, Andy? Yeah. You want me? Should I show? Should I show them the next thing that I, yeah, yeah, that I yeah. looked at? This is yeah. what I I yeah. did. So so I uh, I went in there and I said, check this out. And and I said, Scott, you're not going to believe this. What I did is I pulled up <laughs> the ratio. This yeah. is one of the things I did at least. I pulled up the Baltic yeah. Dry Index to the Uranium Ratio, uh, and what this means is, uh, whenever this is going up the Baltic dry index is outperforming uranium. And when this ratio goes down, it means that mm. uranium is outperforming the Baltic dry index. Well, we looked at the last bull market of uranium, which was 06, 07. And during that time frame, the Baltic dry index waxed uranium. I mean, just waxed <laughs> it during uranium's bull market. 
So I was looking at this going like, oh my God, I got to see this because so I'm going to be at a loss for words. I'm going to have to gather myself here because it's so ridiculous. <laughs> and okay, Andy, so, oh, so, so, sorry to put you on hold, but do you, do you want to just explain to the audience what the uh, Baltic Dry Index is really quick? Well, the Baltic Dry Index is the index of Baltic Dry shipping uh, and what the average charge rate is. So it, it's, it's basically uh, how much it costs to lease a, a ship. Hopefully yeah. I got that right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much right. And dry bulk, when we talk about dry bulk and, you know, what, what's uh, included in this um, index is, you know, basically your iron ores, coal, uh, coal uh, yep. wheat, and things like that, that the shipping companies carry. Um, basically, the carrier to commodities. Yeah, and, and like, if, if we were to look in here, and I'll, I'll just go through a couple of high thing, uh, high level things yep. right now. This is part of my um, Finding Value website that I share. Uh, I, I put on there the shipping cycle and the cycle that these go through. Uh, and it's basically very similar to any commodity uh, that you know, like you'll have excess supply of something. Uh, they usually do it at the peak. They buy too many ships and then they go into this gigantic lull, just like all the commodity producers do. But there's a couple of things I wanted to highlight that I highlighted in the article that I wrote. It says, the, and they're, they're talking about a, the, the container ships and dry bulk tanker ships. Uh, where we want to be is the dry bulk tanker because that's the, where the volatility is. Uh, it says the cycle is less volatile in container ships than in bulk commodity shipping because the former are liner scheduled operators using primarily owned and time chartered ships, whereas the latter are tramp unscheduled operators with a heavy focus on spot deals. So we wanted the leverage to the spot price of the Baltic dry index. And it just gets better as you like start to go and dive into the fundamentals. And it says sustainable up cycles in tanker and dry bulk shipping typically coincide with strong cycles in commodities. Uh, as occurred after the entry of China into the World Trade Organization in 20, 2001, uh, there's now growing talk among analysts of a post COVID commodity super cycle, which, if true, bodes very well for dry bulk shipping and eventually tankers. And if you look at the bottom here, Another one that I highlighted was, I think the cycle will be more pronounced and longer than it has been in the past. That's huge. This is coming from a shipping expert because we haven't seen these low numbers on vessel supply side in 20 years. So when we look at this and we tie everything together with what uh, this expert is saying in this cycle, uh, what's really driving this cycle here uh, is we have a super cycle that's coming. We have shortages that are going to be present in the commodity uh, bull market. And these prices, like we've seen recently, have gone vertical. And if we see a crunch in the dry bulk shipping, and we have, we have this right here, which I still am in amazement. I, I don't believe this chart right here. I, I just can't believe this. I can't believe that the Baltic dry index outperformed uranium to this extent. Yeah. It doesn't even look like uranium had a bull market. I mean, that is ridiculous. So what we're, what we're doing is we're sitting at the front of a, of a super cycle, buying a company who's been basically gathering up vessels at the low. And I'll show you what that looks like. These are the vessel shipping. Uh, this is the secondhand price of five-year-old capsized ships. This guy is buying ships at this price when the peak last time was far up here. And, and what that means is we could get a, a, a revaluation of all of this person's vessels that he's buying is 29 vessels. He's got nine tankers and the rest dry bulk. The, he, they're buying these up at the bottom of the market, which I think is coming at the top will be a complete revaluation of absolutely everything. Now, here's the cool thing of this setup. And we go back and forth, Scott, I know I'm taking a lot of the a lot of the sunshine. No, 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 no. no, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying listening the, to you. The, the, the cool thing about all this is if we go into a shortage of, of some of these commodities, they go into large deficits. That's aluminum, iron ore, uh, which, you know, like steel, uh, all of these different things. And we have this complex ship. They can't ramp the ships up very quickly on this. They will be stuck when they hit these shortages in 2023, 2024, 2025, when we start getting into these deficits. It's, it's a lot of things are going to get gummed up in the supply chain because of shortages. And you can't complete something if you have a shortage in just one little aspect. 
just like cars and their chip shortages, their semiconductor chip shortages. Uh, so they've, they've, they had to shut down lines and, and, it, and it, what basically happened was the used car market uh, went skyrocketing. I think the same thing is going to happen to shipping, to the vessels that these people own. So this guy is literally, he diluted a bunch of stock. He took that money and bought vessels in mad, like in mass. He just bought vessel after vessel after vessel after vessel and loaded his company with vessels. And you can tell now by the growth of the income and revenue, how that's stepping higher because of what he did. And we've got this large pattern, this large pattern here, where if we look at CTRM's pattern with a fractal, that looks absolutely ridiculous. I have to put it on log just to look at it. And this fractal here means that there's the potential to move to the upside on the right-hand side. So not only do the fundamentals look absolutely excellent at the beginning of a commodity bull market, we have a guy who has a company that people hate because I he diluted it and what he did with the money, which is important. It, you don't wanna dilute to run the company. You wanna dilute and add assets to your, to your company. He bought all the assets he possibly could all the assets he possibly could with that money. And it's left with a chart that looks like this that we're drooling over. I mean, I, I gotta like, yeah. you know, clean my shirt up after looking at this chart and looking <laughs> at it. So, so uh, Scott, yeah. you also looked into a bunch of other things uh, related with this company. What, what did you find as well? Yeah, so, so let's just um, share with them what Andy's talking about and we'll <clears throat> just go through it really quickly. But this is what's amazing. Like, so we looked at this thing going, okay, well, First of all, I ask myself, am I looking at the right financial statements? Because I've like, never seen a company valued like this before. So, sorry, this is not financial advice, by the way. Um, it, you've right. got to do your own diligence, due diligence. You can't just rely on a guy on YouTube. But, I mean, okay, so, so this, is, this is what Andy's talking about here. So, what happened here? Like, when we had that 20x gain right here, there was a Reddit squeeze. So when the AMC and GME and all those things were taking off, basically they targeted CTR and going, okay, well, this has huge short interest. Let's, um, let's run, 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 over this, uh, run over the shorts and create a huge short squeeze. So what happened here? If you look at this, this is what's so telling. So all, if you look at all the forums right now, like everyone's disgusted by the amount of dilution um, that the company had undertaken. But I think this is like, the, it's like the most genius CEO that we've seen, right, Andy? Mm -hmm. um, so basically yeah. what happened, if you can see here, this was the Reddit squeeze. Like it's just gone up like crazy. But if you look at the total common shares outstanding for that period, what this guy had done, like the CEO, he was like, okay, well, <laughs> I'm getting these good share prices. Let's bring on ATM. So at the market facility, uh, which means that they can just sell the shares um, into the market and raise equity through equity raises, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. what they did during this period is, if you look at the share, number of shares outstanding, it was 13.12 million. And then if you look at the next quarter, it's 70.73 million. That's huge in terms of share raises. So what they did was they sold the shares uh, using ATM facilities, sold the shares and raised a bunch of money. And if you go to Casper Maritime's website, yeah, you're going to show the timeline of buying those boats. <laughs> I'm going to show you the timeline of what, of what they did. So, so, okay, let's just go. Ooh, right, okay. So let's go, just go to the timeline. So this is January to February 2021. So that's like, oh my goodness, that's so close in time as well. And, and you've made a 10x game within like a month. Okay, so if you go to Casta's um, website and just go to press releases, if I go to the news flow during that time, what you'll see uh, effectively is you've got January, okay? So this is when they activated ATM. So they went, okay, Casta announces 15, three, oh no, that's not it. Okay, so 26 million registered direct offering. So that's basically when they started activating ATMs and started raising money. But amazing news flow here is, okay, this is when they start going crazy with this one. <laughs> Casta, okay, vessel acquisition here, vessel acquisition, vessel acquisition, uh, vessel acquisition, <laughs> vessel acquisition, um, delivery, you know, um, okay, uh, raise 125 million through the ATM facility, right? Vessel acquisition, vessel acquisition, vessel acquisition. <laughs> vessel, it's like the news flow is endless in terms of vessel acquisition. So basically, the Reddit crowd gave this company, for, in my opinion, 
it just gave his company to raise like dirt cheap money, like through through ridiculously good deal in terms of you know the cost of capital through equity raising. And it's given this company the ability to go and buy a ton of ships, really. So they went from, I think, nine ships in 2020 to 29 ships, or six ships in 2020 to 29 ships in 2021. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where it started. That's where it started for us. And, and the, reason, the reason the CEO did that, the reason he had to dilute the shares and raise money uh, through the ATM is he didn't, have, he didn't have anything to loan against. He only had a couple of ships, so they didn't have any like real revenue or, or assets to loan against. So one of the things that you can do is you can release shares, uh, dilute the shares, raise money, and then he bought everything at the bottom of the market. So he did positive things with the money that he raised. He didn't blow it away. He didn't, he didn't get like, you know, hookers or something with it. <laughs> he, got, he got vessels. And that's what we want him to do. We yeah. want him to grow the company uh, at the bottom. And now what he's doing is what we're, what we're seeing is we're, he's actually loaning money to buy more vessels. His goal is to get to 40 vessels right. uh, from what I understand. And he's starting to loan. He's not, he's not hitting the stock anymore. Now, is it that's because right. the stock price is low? Maybe. Um, maybe if it goes up, maybe he'll hit it again. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, I, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure that he's going to do it again because now he's got a lot of assets that he can borrow against. and he's got a lot of income and revenue. So yeah. I don't think he'll necessarily do that because he's got the income and the revenue and he's also got the assets. Yeah, so that's right, that's it right. It doesn't people. make any sense for him to sell any shares into the market right now because there's, the volume's absolutely dried up. So the only time you can actually make good use of ATM facility is when there is good volume and when the share price is rising because then you want to put pressure on it. So, I mean, there is absolutely no reason why this person or, or the company We'll go in and, and dilute a bunch of shares and scare the investors off because then you're, you're going to raise nothing, right? So the cost of capital through equity will be very expensive at this stage when there's very little volume and, and when the share price isn't doing anything. And so, so yeah, dilution um, for us, Andy, when we first looked at it and given the amount of like ATM facility that was available um, uh, according to the prospectus, was dilution. But if you actually look at the share dilution from here, so this was probably when they last sold their shares into the market to create more common shares outstanding. And if you look at the trend here, like they, they, it's just been steady from um, June, 2021. So 93.52. Um, and, and yeah, it's just, it's just stayed steady, which means they haven't diluted the shares uh, in about a year. And, and this is what Andy was talking about in that now they're starting to utilize debt financing, which means they won't be diluting the shares because now they've got all the vessels, as Andy said. They've got $400 million worth of vessels right now. Mm -hmm. $400 million worth of vessels, which they bought at the very bottom. So, so if you look at the financial statements, actually, um, all these vessels that are valued, oops. So it might take a bit of time for me to find. All the vessels that are um, measured at $400 million, uh, $400 million right now, here, so pretty much $393 million, this is measured at cost. So this isn't, this isn't taking into account the appreciation that he might have seen already because the shipping, shipping the D, uh, BDI has gone up, all the shipping companies are um, getting into better utilization rates for their ships. And, and yeah, like ship prices have started going up already if you look at the general market. So this is just cost minus depreciation if you look at the accounting standards. So um, I don't know, like, so your, your PV ratio that we've talked about that is trading in, you know, around 0 0.5, it's probably trading at less than that. It's probably trading at less than that. Um, so yeah, sorry, sorry, going back to the point around debt financing. So if you look at the news flow now, rather than uh, raising uh, capital through equity or, or through dilution of shares, now they're doing debt financing because they have the vessels available. They've got $400 million worth of vessels on their books that um, they can use as collateral to borrow more money. Mm -hmm. And they had $35 million in cash, if you looked. I saw that as well. Yeah, yeah. That's and right. That's right. They've got like... so. The way that I view this company, and maybe you view it the same way. So what they do is they contract these ships out. They, they, have, they contract it out for like, they've been going for like $25,000 a day, uh, roughly, at least the ones that I've seen recently. Yeah, this company yeah. is more or less a royalty company on ships.
because they have a yeah. whole bunch of vessels that are out there that they contract out and get money in. And there's like one guy <laughs> running all of this almost <laughs> him and then like his family. Uh, so the CEO is like 30 years old, a little bit over 30 years old. And his dad is a shipping billionaire who's in this business. <laughs> That's his mentor. So I, I, I find this like completely, I, I don't know. It's almost like when I first saw it, I saw the chart, I looked at the background and I was like, Scott, you got to look at this. I don't even think this is real. Like, I, it just didn't yeah. seem real to me. Like, is this, is this, is, yeah. is this right? Is this like fraud? Yeah. Like, how is this so cheap? I don't get it. And uh, I, I think we came to the conclusion that it's probably not fraud. It's just a good Yeah, deal. so um, so the reason why I don't believe it's fraud, like obviously there's that risk, right? Because completely everything's on paper and there's nothing there. But the reason why I don't believe it's fraud is because it's been audited by, audited by Deloitte, which is a pretty reputable financial audit firm. So I've been a financial auditor um, before. <laughs> I was actually a long time financial auditor. I know exactly what they do as part of the audit process. So it's pretty simple for a company like this um, that they just cite the vessels, they look at the contracts and look at the income flow coming into bank accounts and things like that. So there are multiple ways in which they can verify that these assets actually, actually exist. I would have been a little bit worried if it was an a audit firm that I didn't know of, but it's been audit, audited by one of the bigger um, audit firms, Deloitte. So uh, I think it, it's the, the chance of it being a fraud <laughs> is pretty unlikely. So in your opinion, seeing this set up, and maybe we can talk a little bit about more about the fundamentals if you want, but seeing this setup, yeah. have you seen many companies better than this setup in your opinion? Like what have you seen that this, might this be? Is probably, this is probably the best I've seen. Like in terms of the fundamentals, like, I mean, I've seen like some companies trade like below book value. Um, so I, I, I've had a couple of companies back in 2008, 2009 when there was financial crash that were trading below cash. Like market cap was smaller than their cash levels. You know, they didn't have any debt. Only so few like that, but with this one, it's like a lot less. <laughs> a lot, less. <laughs> yeah. Their market capitalization is a lot less than their book value right now. So basically, what that means is, if they sold all their vessels and just liquidated the company and distributed the 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 um the proceeds from just the sale of the vessel, like we'd be like up two x, three x, four x, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. That that's how ridiculous this is right now to me. Yeah, and, and, and the one thing that, that, that got me, this, and I, I know it's a cheap company. I totally think that's, that's awesome and whatnot. Yeah. But when I look at the ratio of the BDI to uranium yeah. and, and the Baltic dry index to any other commodity, uh, what this is saying is that we have the potential for the largest leveraged move of, of any yeah. sector with a company that is like the cheapest we've ever seen. That just, I yeah. mean, like, this is like, it, it, it's like <laughs> buying Michael Jordan uh, when he's like an all-star player and you're buying him for like a rookie pay of, of like somebody that's like a backup. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. You're just like, why would someone do this? Yeah. Yeah. So, and then you've got on top of it, this pattern, which is a pretty reliable double bottom pattern with a slingshot move. And I'm like, <laughs> can you add anything else to it with the genetics of this thing, the way it looks? I mean, I just, I, I feel like we're watching a basketball game and we're seeing a guy who can run like a 4.140. He can jump like 50 inches, you know, and, and just dunk like mad. And we're just watching him play. And we're like, this guy is insane. <laughs> and, and, and like everyone else is like, yeah, but you know, he, he, uh, he, he did something bad in his past life. And we're just like, this guy's going to dominate. Sorry. That's the way that I, yeah. yeah. That's the yeah. way that I view it. Well, and, and is, yep. Sorry. No, I was going to no, no, go share another thing that we did. Another thing that we did was just pull up a list of all the shipping companies because we want to see, like, money flow is really important for us. So we wanted to see if the money is flowing generally into the shipping industry. And this gives me the, the conviction that I need to get into this trade. Um, and these are all the listed uh, shipping companies that are listed in the ETF BOAT. So we just pulled up a bunch of, like, boat, uh, shipping companies and looked at their charts. And everything was breaking out. All your major plays. We talked about how the majors always lead, and then you know the the, the smaller market capitalization stocks tend to just follow and catch up, you know, do a massive catch up. So these are like the largest shipping companies around the world listed on BOAT, and everything's breaking out. Like if you look at this, there was a there's been a long base breakout, long base breakout. 
you know, like the, all, all these shipping companies are effectively breaking out of their loads. Uh, and, and it tells me that the money is flowing into the sector. Yeah. Yeah, it looks fantastic. And that's, that's the same thing that I do. As I look at the entire sector and look at the volume on those, those companies too. The volume on all yeah, those companies yeah. are just rocketing yeah. higher, which means yes. that yeah. smart money, someone's entering, institutions or smart money is entering these companies in mass. Yes. And we just have the laggard. We've got the small little junior laggard that's uh, <laughs> confused right now. It's like, what should I do? But it's got the pattern. It's got the setup uh, for yes. an incredibly, I think, large size move. Yeah. So We're growing at the fastest rate. Yeah. So how would how would you play this? What what like would you would you put a percent allocation to your portfolio? Like like how would you play this type of move? <clears throat> I already <laughs> have. Like so, yeah. <laughs> so so when I looked into the fundamentals, so even before I understood that um, there was general money flow into the shipping industry, and before I understood the shipping industry in general, so um, I, I just had to put some money in it. So I, I, as much as I like my gold and silver stocks, I just sold some and then just put it into the shipping stock because like the fundamentals are so good. Like the, the flow is there. So what I mean by that is the book value. So even if something horrible went for the company, like I always have that backup knowing that they've got $400 million worth of vessels on their book. I was like, the downside risk is minimal. Like if I, and this is where we've talked about previously, you know, how fundamentals are so important because it gives you the conviction to stay in the trade. So even if the short-term movement doesn't go right, and if it, even if it goes down in the short term, you know that you've got the conviction, you've got the fundamentals, stay in a trade. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely went in. And then yesterday I was like thinking, oh my goodness, maybe I should get more. So I got more. <laughs> I was looking at, okay, so I was looking at the daily chart yesterday. Um, And notice that it's at the very top of my list, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just don't see anything better, right? This is crazy because I'm like, uranium is like the best. Like nothing's going to outperform uranium. But when I look at cast I'm like, maybe this will outperform everything else. So, um, so if, you look at the, if you look at the chart here, it's so beautiful, you know? Um, it's just, just perfect, right? Um, so if you draw this, it's squeezing up, squeezing up. I'm like, I know. okay, this is going to break out any day. Like, all right, there's a gap there, right? right? Because some people talk about the gap down there, but I, I just don't think it will fill. Mm -hmm. And there's a much more massive gap here. Here. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, it could be really quick before we get there. Because if you look at the previous, the genetics of this chart, like, it, that move was rapid. It, it was like within a couple of weeks. <laughs> but it got mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking at this chart going, this is going to pop anytime. So, so look, at, look at how beautiful this chart works, right? So you've got a bunch of like support resistance around here. Hit, 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 and then test, test, and then another support here, come down. And then we're just trying to, we're knocking on the door, you know, before a breakout. So once this breaks out, like the move could be big. So I'm like, oh, I need to get more. <laughs> I'm like, I need this, to get more of this. This move could be pretty big. Confidential look advice. At if you look at the last, um, the, the last way that that fell down on, on the, the, yeah. the last booty bottom, we'll call it the last bottom there, see how it came down and, 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 and has that little like dip lower and then how it came yeah. back up. We have the same yeah. type of genetics on the yeah. right hand side as the other, we'll call it left hand cheek. So the way that, yeah. it, that it comes down and then came is coming back up is the same thing. And they almost always kind yeah, of angle looks, slightly upward really if it's like a massive move that's coming. It's, it's like yeah. the sellers are leaking out, but the buyers keep pushing it a little bit higher and higher and higher. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> it just goes. Yeah, it's the yeah, same squeezy, type of squeezy, genetics. Squeezy, yep. squeezy. You know, yep. You've got it. <laughs> <laughs> and and what um, Andy was talking about with, with this double bottom pattern, normally what happens is it goes right below, just below the previous yep. low. And then it fakes, the, fakes up the, the sellers or, or the buyers or whatever, uh, the holders. And then you, you run back up and then you consolidate for a while. And then it's very common to see just the, yeah, break up with, and it could be rapid. So yeah, I didn't want to spend any more time lingering and thinking about whether I should get it or not. Like the day I saw it, I went in and bought. <laughs> day I saw it, I, 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 I saw my gold stock and bought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was in there buying already. So <clears throat> that's, I mean, that's what I was doing. 
is there anything else about the shipping uh, industry that you learned that you'd like to share? Yeah, 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 definitely. So, so basically, after I made the purchase, and this is where I said I sprinkle in, uh, sprinkle in uh, into my investments normally, because if I see something that's good, I just need to get a little bit of interest in it, right, to start off with, because I know like chart wise, it's looking beautiful and can run any day. But then this is when I started going into a little bit more into the shipping industry and what the fun fundamentals are. And what I understood basically is it's very, like Andy said, it's very much cyclical, just like the mining industry. And so what you see here is, this is dry bulk historical fleet growth and forecast. Um, and what you see here is at the, at the bottom here, <laughs> when no one's interested in shipping, no, this is basically the deliveries and scrapping of new ships, right? Dry bulk ships. And so when, when the markets are low, um, no one's interested, no one's really buying, the, the order books are really small and there's like hardly any scrapping or whatever. But then <laughs> as a shipping, the dry bulk index was picking up and um, the, the cost of you know, leasing out the, or renting these ships are going through the roof. What you see is the order book increase heaps and then all the deliveries happening all in one hit. You know, exactly, exactly the same as the mining industry. If the commodity prices are going up, everyone's starting to build their mines and everyone's starting to go into production. And then in a couple of years, you know, you get huge influx of commodities coming on the market, driving the prices low. But what you see here is because the shipping, uh, the, the BDI has fallen continuously from, here, uh, from around 2009, from memory, down to here. Like you just said, like all these order, it takes time. So to build these vessels, it takes around two to three years minimum. Um, for, for them to be built. So all the, all the people ordering here to try and get a piece of that action pricing, uh, uh, a piece of um, the price upward movement. And then once they all came into the market, there was no demand for BDI. It was dry bulk ships because the market was going down. And then you've got all these scrapping. So what that ultimately means is now we've got a lot less ships. Mm -hmm. and, and this is Netflix growth. Like it's going, it's on the low, it's on the low. Um, and what you see here is, this is the utilization, uh, utilization rate. And what you see here is it's got, it's got the rounding, bo uh, rounding bottom here. If you look at from 2013, 14, it's starting to pick up utilization mm -hmm. rate. And if you, if I went into quite a lot of these companies, um, presentations and so on. So like even golden ocean group, which is one of the bigger, bigger, um, dry Baltic, uh, sorry, the dry bulk shipping company. And you can see that utilization rate is actually coming up quite a bit. So from the lows of around 75% utilization of their vessels to 100%, which means that there is more demand for those ships. <laughs> so it's starting to pick up all the right, all the, all the things are trending in, uh, in the right direction. I feel like, yeah, I mean. Well, how, yeah, how did, uh, pretty much. How, how do you think ESG fit into this? Do that, because weren't a lot of, of, the, of the shipping companies very reluctant to build new ships because of, uh, yeah. future ESG targets and whatnot for emissions and all this other stuff. Yep, there it is. Yeah, you're probably a better place to talk through this, Andy. You're, you're the one who introduced me to the ESG stuff. So do you want to talk through it? Well, I mean, I can try. I didn't look at this particular slide, but yep. yeah, uh, ESG, what, what, what's happening with ESG, the environmental social governance, is they're putting all these standards in place for emissions. And the, the one thing that I was looking at, just this is for mining companies, this is for any company in general, is how much carbon they release. So a lot of these companies, they were looking at building all these ships and they're saying, well, why would I build ships if I have to build a different ship in the future if these emit carbon today? So a lot of them were very reluctant to build uh, new ships uh, given ESG uh, measures in the future because they, they knew that they were gonna have to pay, we'll call it, you know, they're, they're gonna have to pay for it later if they start buying these new ships and implementing today. So. The, the way that I would play this, if I was a CEO of a company, is I would buy used ships at dirt cheap prices because nobody wants to take these ships on with ESG measures. You want to buy all of these ships with the minerals and the energy you already sunk into it for a very cheap price at the bottom. You'd accumulate it just like Castor Maria Times doing. And then when we get into a, a squeeze in the future, because not a lot of ships are being built, uh, they're going to have all these vessels that are able to ship things uh, around the world. And I don't, this chart here, I don't, this is the seaborne trade and CO2 emissions indexed. Uh, it looks like they have the seaborne trade and then the intensity uh, and the targets. I can see that. Yeah. But uh, yep. I was just- Yeah, so, so yeah, basic, basically what Andy was, uh, I, I don't think this is too relevant. So 
what, what you're basically right. saying is that because of ESG requirements, people are reluctant to build new ships because they, they didn't know what the requirements are going to be, which create even more of a shortage in the shipping industry. <laughs> yep. So, the, yeah, the, the bullish fundamentals there. Yeah, and, and then uh, when I'm looking out forward, and I, I'm just trying to tie this all together, uh, if we get volume increases in shipping for dry bulk, and if there are shortages of certain minerals where... Let, let's say they want to move a lot of X, Y, Z, but you're short A to build these ships. Uh, a is going gonna, is gonna to basically blockade new ships from coming in. It's, it's a, I'm just calling A. A could be aluminum or whatever. Uh, they, they're not yep, yep. bringing on new ships because of shortages and, and supply chain problems. There could be a massive uh, short squeeze in a lot of commodities all at the same time, raising the price of those commodities drastically. But at the same time, there could be a very large shortage of ships. And what happens yeah. is the, the mining companies may not make all that much money because they have to ship this stuff somewhere. So the money is going to get transferred. Those profits will get transferred, uh, a lot of it, to the shipping companies because they're going to be at war to ship this stuff around the world. So yeah. it, it's kind of like, I think playing both sides of this is the best thing to do. You, you buy the commodity companies and then you buy the shipping companies just in case they're the ones that end up with all the money. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, 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 and you've got like China and stuff right now, stockpiling a lot of commodities because, you know, they, they want to secure their supplies. You know, they know that commodities, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, there are shortages of commodities everywhere. And so, you know, as we, as all the countries around the world feel that shortage, they will want to secure the supply of those commodities, which means more shipping. <laughs> it does. It does. And, and, with and another interesting... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and with a company that's buying this stuff at the bottom is a small shipping company and it's almost like a royalty company because it doesn't have a lot of, 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 yeah. of costs. There's no like overhead with it. This is like yeah. genius move because what he's doing is yeah. he's, he's making the... He's, he's contracting it out. I mean, that... Yeah. This, I don't know if you saw that or if you caught that, like the beauty of this is so insane because it is literally a royalty company on ships it is. is what he's created. It is. And, and it is. he nets this, this, this delta of the, the BDI with just vessels that are out there. It, I, it's just crazy to me. I know. To think about it. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's like the craziest business model ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so... Yeah, and, and obviously there are other bullish factors as well, like your geopolitical tensions, like sanctions in Russia, which has, you know, apparently created all these inefficiencies in the routes, uh, in the in the routes around the uh, around the sea as well. So, you know, inefficiencies mean that it takes longer to ship stuff, which means more time out in the water, <laughs> which yep. means higher vessel prices or, or leasing prices. So, yeah, there are just so many bullish factors for shipping right now. I think. Yeah, and, and, and I would, I mean, obviously I wouldn't put all my money into one company. Uh, yeah, that's no. just not something that I do, but I think it's something, you know, this company especially is one company that I would definitely take into consideration uh, and a lot of other yeah. dry bulk shipping companies as, as well. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and I'm just looking at all the bullish factors as well in terms of demand, because obviously, you know, iron ores, coal and things like that, they're all dependent on infrastructure spending and how many, you know, how much houses we're building around the globe and things like that. So if you look at all those figures, like the new housing starts, it's going up, it's on an uptrend, so it looks good. <laughs> if you look at the total construction spending um, in the United States, it's, it's, on a, it's on an uptrend, so it looks good. So in terms of that demand, then in terms of, I guess, all the fiscal policies that will be implemented because of the downturn in the economy and because of um, how much governments want to stimulate the economy through fiscal spending and through infrastructure programs, like the infrastructure bill that United States announced last year, you know, um, there, there is no bare case for demand for commodities right now. So yeah, it's looking good. Yeah, it, it's looking absolutely fantastic. And so, so to sum this up real quick, the play is we want commodity prices to go up and then we want to squeeze in shipping yeah. for this play yeah. to work. Uh, so yes. the, 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 the rise in the commodity price will allow the shipping companies to charge more money for their services. Uh, that's why that yeah. is important. And then the squeeze comes with the volume of, of things being shipped. Yeah. So I... I, I, I don't, think, I don't I think, think you want to talk through the crazy numbers that we were talking through with CTR and valuation, Andy. 
Because like I was like, oh my goodness, this could be like a hundred x. I mean, not financial advice, like, <laughs> but and and you were like, this could be a thousand x. <laughs> and we we're just laughing our heads off. You want to just do a well, quick count? I, I don't know. I I, I don't think we want to just quickly do this. I I've forgotten what we did well, to get I, to I, the thousand. I think I I mean, if you look at like the five, so the vessels themselves, they could go up five x. The vessels. So yeah. if you just do five yeah. times your your vessel cost. Uh, that's yeah. so. So let's say you go to four hundred million, and then you go to like two billion, and then you compare your 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 two billion in relationship to your market your market cap total today. Uh, you, you just kind of yeah. look at it and say, okay, I, I I could get, you know, like like a like a fifteen bagger or something like that uh, today. Okay. Just yeah. based off of the you vessel could. appreciation uh, of, of what could be. Yeah, you could. So hold on, sorry, sorry, this is- You're, um, you're off a little yeah. bit, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, so, so it's two billion to go. buy that. Yeah. So just off the book value, if the vessel prices were to go up to the 2007 high, like that's just 11X. That's, that's <laughs> book value though. That just, is just book, book value. value. <laughs> this is book, book value. value. That's <laughs> not, I mean, this right, isn't so, like- so, <laughs> Yeah, so let's just do a quick help. So, They've got vessels, right? So right now they've got 29 vessels in total, right? Yep. And the daily, average daily rate for the last quarter was 25,000 per been day. About 25,000, yeah. Yeah, 25,000 per day per vessel, which mm -hmm. means the total revenue per day was 725,000. Their utilization rate was 99%. <laughs> effectively one <laughs> yeah effect yeah so basically you've got this number of days so okay let's just go 725 divided by uh multiplied by 365 which is you know here and so you've got right now annual revenue of this but okay let's just go to the high side because this is what you showed me andy so um mm -hmm. i'll stop sharing this for the right now and then we'll go back to the baltic dry index because that shows us how much the 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 daily rates of these ships can go up by so if you go bdi divided by gold because i like to measure everything in actual money real money so look at this and this mm -hmm. is once again how beautiful the charts work like look at balanced here and then there's like a whole bunch of like it, it came as support support resistance support resistance all the way throughout <laughs> We've just broken out of this line. Now we're uh, coming back to test support. And if we go back up to our previous line, so it's sitting around one, right? If we go back up to our previous line, it's sitting at 14. It means it will, it might outperform gold by a factor of 14 over the next few years, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so let's just go back. Let's just, if, let's just assume that um, gold is gonna just stay at Where's its that? current price, right? Yep. So we're not gonna. You're gonna multiply in. by fourteen. <laughs> yep. So let's just go this. Okay. So revenue could be. Right. So we're talking about three point six billion dollars in revenue if the BDI index came up to its previous cycle high. Yep. And so what would the net profit be? So. I think these guys, as you said, Andy, because it's like a royalty company, I don't think their expenses will blow up. But let's just give them a conservative estimate and just go, okay, they're going to have maybe 50% in net profit, which seems to be quite normal for other shipping companies um, that mm -hmm. have more complex um, operations, right? It's not just a simple uh, lease thing, but let's just go 50% times that. So this is net profit, assuming 50%. Okay, you get to 1.83 billion in net profit potentially, right? Per year. And so, yeah. okay, let's, let's forget about all the MPV calculations or whatever, discounted cash flow, because I don't think that matters. Let's just do a simple calculation. Let's just apply a PE ratio of 15, right? Because yeah. that, that's like historical average for your Dow Jones industrial average, basically. Mm -hmm. So let's mm -hmm. just give them 15. Like this could be conservative because once you're in a bubble, like if you look at like Netflix and Apple and things like yeah, that, yeah. they're trading well above, above this figure. But let's just give them this figure. Let's say 15 P rate. This is right? going to be crazy. Okay. And let's get, get to market. You're going to get like way. almost 30 billion. Yep. 
Thirty billion. Seven and a half billion. What's okay? Divided so by one. We just divide this by yep. this amount here. So this is the total return. This is the potential total return. Making these assumptions. <laughs> yep, 162 times your money. Yeah. And what's our know. risk? What's our risk to the downside? It's like we're bouncing off support on the BDI. Right. We we've yeah. got a pattern that's way down low, ready to break to the upside. It's like, well, that's that's yeah. perfect. <laughs> yeah. And and this is the craziest thing. Like, I mean. We're talking about vessels at 20. Like, so we made a lot of conservative assumptions as well, because I think they will be purchasing a lot more vessels. So your vessel, your fleet will probably grow, which means your revenue will probably grow as well. Like just remember they purchased 21, uh, 23 ships last year. Like I don't know how many, how many they're planning to purchase this year, but that could double. Like if you look at Golden Ocean Group, um, which is worth $2.3 billion in market cap right now, um, they've got 80 ships. So this, in terms of market capitalization, could seem ridiculously small. It might look it like a small company, it but is. it's actually not that small. Like your biggest bulk, uh, dry bulk shipper has 80 ships. These guys have 29 ships. It's, like, it's not really a small company. No, and, and, and it's, it's run like a royalty company. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculously ridiculous. awesome. I don't know. Like, I just, yeah. With a billionaire mentor. I see. Yeah. <laughs> When I do these videos with you, I feel like I need to get more of the stuff that I talk about. <laughs> not financial advice. Like this, remember guys, this is not financial advice. And we're just talking about a good scenario that could play out. So yeah, you've, you've got to do your own due, due diligence. I mean, it could be a total fraud. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> it, it, it seems unreal, right? It does. It seems unreal. This is the craziest thing. Like I was like double checking, triple checking whether I was looking at the right ticker, like whether, whether I was looking at the right company, the right market care. I had to go back to like all the financial statements just to make sure that, you know, the number of shares outstanding was correct on Google yes. Finance and, and in trading view because I just couldn't believe the valuation. So yeah, I think I need to get more. I don't have enough. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, I'm. Uh, Here it is. Here it is. I've I've positioned well in my tax free accounts in case this were to uh, do very well. I I see it very similar to like almost SM Energy, uh, the setup, the the size of it, and even if even if the 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 fractals off a little bit, it'd still be a gigantic return. Uh, oh, even if, yeah. you know from the Reddit squeeze being, let's say it it, it accentuated it yeah. a little bit, but let's say if it was an eight or a nine x or a ten x, that's still a gigantic move because. SM Energy does seven and a half X. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's going to be a little bit bigger than SM Energy. I do. But I also think SM Energy is a hundred, you know, a hundred times from, from that bottom yeah. where I got. So yeah, yeah it makes, yeah. About, makes sense. About 150 for that and, you know, 150, 160 versus a hundred or something. Yeah. yeah, this is good. And what's, what's, what's good is this is not a speculative company. This is a value play. Yeah. Uh, they they like, have this is a they have company. money like this is value. Yeah. This isn't the yeah. this isn't like we're poking holes in the ground trying to find something like like the values are yeah. there. They have the value is there. The value is there. This is like this is like traditional your Benjamin Graham intelligent investor type of value company. Like and this yes. is what what I really like. I mean like um, down deep, <laughs> I like really, uh, uh, companies that provide the cash flow that provide the revenue and income. Because you know then, like, it can't really go wrong. I mean, it can if it's fraud, but I, don't, I can't really think of any other case that where it can go wrong um, other than fraud. Yeah. We, we can't find the fraud, at least. Maybe, yeah, maybe the, they the can, if, if, they, if they have fraud, they're, they're, they're hiding it pretty well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. They, that's right. They're massively and, duping a bunch of people. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And the thing is, I was like thinking about giving the investor relations team a call um, because I just wanted to talk to them. But um, I, I was like, you know, if Deloitte couldn't find them and they probably spent like, I, I, they spent quite a bit of money on um, financial auditing as well. So if, if they couldn't find it, if the auditors couldn't find it, then there's no way that I'll be able to find out fraud um, just by giving them a call. So, um, yeah. Right. All right. Well, I think we'll end it there. I think that's all the, the information that I've got. I don't, you have anything else to share? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't. <clears throat> all right, Scott, this has been a fun talk. I really do uh, enjoy talking to you about, you know, all sorts of uh, stock related or financial related things. So uh, thanks for sharing this information with everybody on the, the YouTube channel. And maybe I'll share this uh, first 
with uh, the website. So maybe they'll see it first and then we'll uh, move on to uh, the YouTube channel. All right, guys. Yeah. Sorry, um, Andy. Can I just yep. quickly share? Yes, do it. do it. Do it. <laughs> I forgot about it. Um, yeah, so, so this is like the one, um, well, a couple of verses in the Bible that's really stuck in my head these days. So it's 1 Thessalonians um, 5, uh, six, verses 16 to 18. So it says, always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belongs to Christ Jesus. So with this one, like, I'm just trying to be grateful and I am grateful in all circumstances. So, you know, I've had a back pain, like really bad back pain, like three weeks ago. And I was like, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, when you start saying thank you, and the words are so powerful because God made the world through, through his words and words are just so powerful. So I would just encourage you, like if you're going through difficult times or, or good times, even, you know, just continuously say thank you. And um, I, I, I'm sure your life will change for the better. That's all I wanted to share. All right. Uh, thanks for coming on, Scott. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll thanks obviously then. hopefully can do this again with something else. And uh, yep. we'll see everyone else next time. This is Finding thanks, Value. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.